So we were talking about um, the standardization of Chinese architecture. And um, we were looking at a book called Ying Zao Fa Shi from the 12th century, um, <clears throat> the building standard published officially um, by the Song Imperial government. And um, <clears throat> the book spent a large amount of um, textual and um, image space on Daogong, the bracket system. And indeed, um, the brackets um, has a, you know, the bracket system has a special <coughs> position <coughs> in traditional Chinese architecture. Uh, <coughs> so in the book, um, basically it only explain and illustrate um, the structural elements you know, in the plan drawing, in the section drawing, known as Di Pan Tu and Ce um, Yang Tu, respectively. So nothing else except for the brackets were um, illustrated <coughs> in terms of, you know, those, um, what might be considered as decorative aspect in, in, in architecture. And indeed, the brackets were specially illustrated and explained precisely because it is not just decorative, right? It's, a, it's very um, functional, structural, and uh, at the same time, decorative. So that's something you know, I wanted to, to focus on. Um, that is, the bracket <coughs> is... Um, simultaneously a structural, functional, and uh, decorative aspect. So all three functions can be um, observed in the Dogong. So <clears throat> um, in terms of the, you know, functional and a structural aspect, the brackets, um, it, it deepers the eave overhang, which is very important um, for the protection of the wall. <coughs> and it made a transition between the roof and, and the wooden frame underneath. Um, it was also capable of adjusting roof height and a sloping degree. Uh, for example, um, there are slanting members you know, like this in the brackets. Um, so that is called a, uh, called on. Called on. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> the angle of that wooden member can be adjusted to adjust the slope of the roof. And um, <clears throat> also, you know, as a joint between the roof and the uh, column, brackets um, created a complicated uh, joint. So it's not a single one-on-one -on -one member connection of a joint. So from the tectonic point of view, it is a very complicated joint. And uh, that joint was made um, of numerous smaller members. Um, and thus created some kind of a redundancy in terms of connection. And uh, that redundancy 
is um, pre pre precisely needed during earthquake. So um, when there were earthquake um, happening, the shifting of the structure might damage or break some of those smaller joints in this kind of big joint. Um, but the chance is very low to have all those small connection broken simultaneously. And um, so that redundancy um, created a very anti seismic uh, flexible structure. So, um, <clears throat> so redundancy, um, structural redundancy or connection redundancy is needed for good anti seismic um, performance. Um, and uh, indeed, before the Yuan Dynasty, you know, up to the Song Dynasty, um, traditional Chinese architecture had very little artificial decoration. So today we are kind of used to, to see Chinese architecture being, you know, painted um, with the figurative decorations all over, <coughs> and especially um, on the wooden members. Um, but uh, up to the Song Dynasty, traditional Chinese architecture didn't have that much artificial decoration uh, for buildings like this. And this is the Guanyin Pavilion from the uh, Dulu Si Monastery. And indeed, you don't see <coughs> uh, much artificial decoration. The major kind of decorative aspect are those bracket, set, um, bracket sets, right? Um, and of course, um, these were not purely decorative. They are structural, and they also created those anti-seismic um, performance. So let's take a look at how the this kind of a, um, joints were made to create this uh, overall joint uh, between the supporting system and the roof structure. So first we have a, you know, the column and those columns are fixed to their precise location by the tie beam, right? So here we have the column and the tie beam. The tie beam is not um, load bearing. Their function is to uh, create a stable grid of the columns, right? Like indic those indicated in the Di Pan Tu, the plan drawing in Yin Zhao Fa Shi, right? So that's the function of these tie beam. They are not load bearing. They just make connection so that the columns are not going to shift or move during the construction of the upper structures. Um, the actual beam, the actual load bearing beam is not directly connected with the column. It is actually connected with the column through the bracket, through the dogon. Uh, so the actual load bearing beam would be somewhere there. So column and the tie beam and uh, <clears throat> the column has a pin and that is to receive the, um, the block, right? So this is the um, column top block um, this is known as the, the dou, right? So the, the Chinese term dou gong, dou refer to the blocks. And this is the master block that is located directly on top of the column. 
So the dough or the master block is already carved to receive um, the gong. So this is the, uh, we call it the arm. And um, in Chinese, it's called the gong. Um, so dou gong, right? So that's a Chinese term for bracket. It actually refer to the block and the arm. <coughs> so on top of the, um, the gong, uh, well, uh, a crossing arm, right? So crossing arm sit on top of the master block. And these arms um, are loaded with smaller dough, smaller, smaller blocks. Um, <clears throat> and those smaller blocks are um, indented to receive more uh, gong or more arms. A crossing member and also carved to receive the diagonal member, the on. And they are also loaded with smaller blocks and uh, more arms filling member and uh, filling member. Um, so more blocks and uh, <coughs> another uh, filling members. So here we have the um, diagonal on. Um, so the number of filling member, as well as the um, layer of this arm um, can be adjusted to adjust the slope of this diagonal member on, right? So if you put another arm here and uh, put another layer um, or, you know, you adjust that carve and that on could be <coughs> more tilted. Or if you adjust the, um, you know, the height of this member and adjust that line and it could be more um, level. So the on can also be used to support uh, smaller blocks though. And uh, arm on top of block um, filling members. And it's also kind of stabilize um, the members, the other members. <clears throat> so on the, on the arm blocks. And um, so this one is to receive the future, you know, rafters. Um, so it is also kind of carved um, to reflect the angle um, of the of the roof. So more filling and uh, stabilizing members. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> this is the actual beam. This is the actual beam, load bearing beam. Right? So column, tie beam, and a beam. But in between the load bearing beam and the column, it, there is this dogo, right? This, this bracket. So it's not a direct uh, location. <coughs> Some scholar, like um, the author of the pictorial history, um, uh, one of the major textbook you, you, you read, <coughs> Liang Sicheng, uh, Professor Liang, and uh, you know, he called this the Chinese capital. So he compare he compared this with um, with the 
you know, Western architecture like the, the Doric, um, the Ionic, the Corinthian. Um, and indeed, like the um, capital in the classical orders, this bracket <coughs> was also making transition between column and a beam. <coughs> However, in the Chinese case, they were uh, made of many smaller members and those smaller member um, had flexibility. You know, unlike just one block of stone serving as the capital in Western architecture, um, <clears throat> in traditional Chinese architecture, this brackets um, had that um, flexibility and had that um, redundancy to prevent a collapse um, when earthquake happen. Because during earthquake, these would, sh would, would shake and twist, but they would be able to sustain um, the you know, structural integrity. Um, so after the earthquake, some repair might be needed, but the whole structure usually do not collapse because of that structural uh, redundancy. So the beam is carved to receive purling, right? <clears throat> so um, on top of the beam, we have this purling. The most significant joint in a post and lintel structure is the joint between column and a load bearing beam. And it is precisely that part that is um, strengthened. So um, beam and purlin, and then the purlin support a rafter, right? On top of the, the purlin, we have the rafter. Um, <clears throat> so there is an additional part of the rafter that is called the flying rafter, um, Fei Chuan. And it is that flying rafter um, that connected, uh, cr uh, that created the upturning curve of a Chinese roof. So otherwise, you know, you won't have that. And again, it could be adjusted to, uh, to be kind of flamboyant, um, raising higher, or it could be more flat. So that, that angle could be adjusted, but usually you have this, this flying rafter to create the, that upturning, upturning eve uh, in traditional Chinese architecture. Um, so here we are looking from above and now looking from below and we are kind of more in the um, interior position looking up at the eve, right? So that would be the wall separating the interior and exterior. And there we have the, the eve. And uh, here we are looking from exterior and looking at that, that angle, right? So this is a typical joint between the column and the roof structure. <clears throat> And um, on the column top, that on is, is directly under, under the beam. But on, on a intercolumnar location, that on that slanting member, diagonal member would go all the way up to the location below a purling, right? So um, this is a the column top bracket set. So imagine, you know, there is another column, and there is a column top bracket, but in between, you would have more bracket set, and for that bracket sets, there wouldn't be a beam to stop that slant slanting member, and that slanting member would go all the way under the roof and thus created those 
kind of a three-dimensional connection. So you have some places that the brackets are uh, connected with the beam, but there are also other location where um, the, the bracket is directly connected with the purlin above. Um, <clears throat> and um, so that created a three-dimensional uh, con connection, uh, not just on one layer, but on different different layers and different um, different places, uh, making a complicated, um, very comprehensive connection. So the in one word, the roof and the supporting system are integrated. You know, more integrated. And for for those intercolumnar, for those intercolumnar bracket set, the tie beam is load bearing, right? So when I say the tie beam is not load bearing, <clears throat> I'm referring to the main kind of structure. But for the intercolumnar uh, bracket sets, its load is is upon the tie beam, right? So <clears throat> um, if you, we borrow the uh, classical Western terminology in the analysis of um, Dogong, we know that Vitruvius talked about the three requirements for architecture. The first one is utilitas, that is, um, commodity, you know, the function. So <clears throat> the bracket um, had the uh, function of enlarge the eave overhang. And that is its commodity. It is useful. It protect the wall. It also kind of uh, provide um, shadow and uh, protect that um, platform. So when you are standing under the eave, you won't be exposed to sunshine or be um, under weather, right? So it, 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 it provides a roof for the exterior surrounding area for the building. That is the uh, commodity or <coughs> utilitas in the um, Vitruvian term. <clears throat> and it is also a uh, structural, right? It contributed to the firmness of the building, which we have already um, explained in great detail. And that fit in the um, um, Vitruvian definition of firmitas, right? Firmness. And finally, um, Vitruvius require beauty for you know, true architecture uh, called uh, Venustus, right? Venustus. And indeed um, that um, bracket, especially in the later, late imperial Chinese architecture, brackets were um, painted um, harmoniously to create a decorative band under the E. <clears throat> so that decorative band, horizontal, can be compared to the frieze in classical architecture. You know, we know in classical architecture, we have the, um, we have the column and then the, um, um, the architrave and the frieze and then the cornice, right? So, so that, that part is called entablature, right? So you um, you have all taken uh, thirteen ten, you know that classical order. So that <coughs> bracket, and in this case, um, Professor Liang's um, reference it as a Chinese capital is is not very um, suitable because. If we borrow that Western order concept, 
Now this part would be considered a capital. And uh, that would be the architrave and this bracket is actually um, <coughs> uh, <coughs> comparable to freeze um, in classical order. And that part is the uh, cornice, of course. Um, but of course, um, Professor Liang is mainly looking at you know, medieval Chinese architecture you know, before the late imperial, before the Yuan dynasty. And in that case, uh, yes, the um, kind of bracket is more uh, like a capital. But uh, <clears throat> the late imperial architecture as, as represented by this one, the structural element of bracket um, became less and less important. And gradually by the Qing dynasty, brackets became almost purely decorative. Uh, its structural function was not as strong as those early wooden structure like during the Tang dynasty or the Song dynasty. So we might say from, <clears throat> from the early imperial to the late imperial period, the vinastus um, function of the dogong or the aesthetic function of the dogong rise um, gradually and its uh, structural function uh, or the, you know, the formitas <coughs> aspect of dogong diminish gradually. And indeed, its size also, you know, diminish. Um, the early brackets were big <coughs> compared to the entire building. And the later one, like this one, this is from the 18th century. And uh, proportionally speaking, the brackets are much smaller uh, compared to the early structures. So um, the bracket had more function than the three functions of um, classical, you know, Vitruvius. In Chinese architecture, the module was also based on bracket. We know that in classical architecture, it is the diameter of the, um, of the column, but in Chinese architecture, the bracket is so important that its member provided the, um, the module for the whole, whole structure. Uh, <clears throat> that module is called a cai, um, in Song Dynasty architecture and in Ying Zhao Fa Shi, it explained the, the Cai system as a module. And what is a Cai? Um, you know, before before I, I explain, you know, what what that that Cai is, let's first take a look at the um, you know what this module can create. <clears throat> Um, in the Song Dynasty, you know, by the way, a Cai refer to basically the section of the arm that is a module. You know, this is the arm, or you know, that is an arm, or a section. If you cut that arm that way, you will get this rectangle, right? Get this rectangle. And that is called a cai. That is called a cai. So that was used as a module for the whole um, structure. Um, all the other members, wooden members and dimensions was based on that rectangle unit. So <clears throat> it create a hierarchy. So if you choose a smaller cai, say, you know, four inch by five uh, um, by six inch and you create um, smaller building like that.
But if you define the dimension of the Cai, you know, as eight inch um, by 12 inch, then it will, you might create a building bigger than this, um, you know, as big as this one. Uh, in terms of proportion, they are very similar, but in terms of scale, they are very different. And that is the result of different grade of Cai. So the Cai, <clears throat> in another word, is not one specific dimension. It is a unit. It is a unit. It is a shape. The absolute dimension can be changed, but that shape remains. And once you decide the module for a specific um, building, then all the other dimension of that building is pretty much uh, decided, pretty much settled. So different, um, different grade of this unit of this module create buildings of different scale, but with very harmonic, very, uh, very similar um, proportion. And that created harmony uh, in the built environment, right? So this building and that building, the looks very similar in terms of proportion. Um, the difference is their actual size and the, um, the cause of that, act, uh, of that difference in size was the, um, the, the choose of different module, uh, different, different type. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so here we are. That is the um, um, the eight grades of the of the module of the type, All right. So <clears throat> um, and that's the smallest one, grade eight, and that is the largest one, grade grade one. So. Um, the dimension in grade one doubles the dimension of grade eight. And then two to seven are in between, right? So this dimension in grade one is twice the number of that one. And that is twice the length of that one. So that's these were all kind of very um, carefully defined in the Song Dynasty book, Ying Zhao Fa Shi. So that Cai, <coughs> called a Cai, was used for uh, great carpentry uh, in, in, in the Ying Zhao Fa Shi term. That's called great carpentry. Great carpentry, or Da Mu Zuo. Um, was used for the construction of structure, right? So everything we have explained so far is great carpentry, including the bracket. Bracket is part of the great carpentry, da mu zuo. And um, so there's another module called the fen, uh, called the zhi. This is not, so not, not fen. Fen is the uh, smaller division of that cai. All right, so it is divided. Um, each cai is divided into uh, 15 by 10 fen. Right? So that dimension is divided into 15, and that dimension is divided into 10. So in another word, the cai fen system defined the proportion of that module that is always a 3 to 2. Uh, because the, the, the fin is the, is the same for the same module, right? 15 to 10. Um, it's always 15 to 10. That is, you know, 3 to 2, of course. 
So that's called a, the Cypher system. Cypher system um, is for the, the great carpentry for the structural element. element. And there's also a smaller module that's called, the, that is called, um, actually called a zhi. <clears throat> and that is zhi. <clears throat> um, is always divided into fen. Fen refer to the smaller division, while the cai is 15 by 10, the zhi is always a six to four, right? Six to four. And that is also three to two, of course. Proportion are the same, but it is smaller. And the zhi, <coughs> the zhi and the fen system was used for the building of what is called the small carpentry. The small carpentry refer to, um, you know, you know, doors, windows, um, shelves, um, you know, the semi-permanent um, furnitures, right? So um, <clears throat> the same book explained both the great carpentry and the small carpentry. Although in this class, we explain the great carpentry uh, more in detail because that is more architectural. The rest of them um, has more to do with interior decoration and uh, you know, you know, crafts art. <clears throat> but there is a, the book has given both the cai and the zhi. And both, both of them are divided into fen for more kind of, um, precise measurement. Um, yeah, so here basically it's the, the large image of the previous slide. So here we have the cai, here we have the zhi, and both of them were divided into fen, 15 by 10, six by four. <clears throat> and that cai in the great carpentry is is that is that that section in another word so if you have a log whose section is a cai then that log can be used to to shape the arm in the do, in the dogong the, the gong in the bracket so you just carve it and you create an arm. Uh, <clears throat> and then the other members are all, you know, um, the times of that unit, right? So you can say, for example, the column, the column, um, which is a circle, but you can talk about its um, dimension. Um, um, how many fen, right? So a cai is 15, so that diameter could be, for example, uh, 60 or something. Um, or you can talk about a beam, you know, a beam located on top of the um, bracket, you know, that could be, um, <clears throat> that could be force high. So if it is force high, then, then it, that beam would be like that big, right? So it's four times on each dimension, four times on each dimension for that big beam located on top of a bracket. So that's a force high beam, which is really big. Um, and its proportion is also three to two. So you have always have that proportion for the section of major load bearing members in the post and lintel system, right? Except for the circle column. <clears throat> um, 
And we have already explained that the jump, right, in Chinese architecture. So that layers are called a jump. I think now we understand better why it's called a jump, because this looks like it's jumping out. One jump, two jump, three jump. So this would be called a three jump dogong, three jump bracket. And uh, this one, one, two, three, four, five. This is a five jump. This is a three jump. This is also a three jump. This is just one jump, right? And this has no jump, zero. So um, the number of jump also create hierarchy in Dogon system, right? So it created different complexity, different complexity um, in the uh, in this kind of decorative aspect of the um, of the dogon, and of course, it also, you know, if you want to support a very big beam, very thick beam, then you might need uh, more more jump to create a large top. Uh, for the brackets, and um, those can the you know the beam can be smaller. Um, so um, and on the facade, um, you create that different complexity, um, different kind of uh, ornateness um, under the eave. So that is also hierarchical higher level buildings has more jumps. Um, <clears throat> so again, you know, draw your attention to the difference from classical capital. So here we have a very complicated joint between the, po the, the post and the lintel. While in classical architecture, that is very um, straightforward. Right, the post and the lintel is just one on top of the other. But in traditional Chinese timber construction, there is a complicated joint created by the bracket. And um, so that hierarchy is not only in, you know, reflected in the scale um, that is created by the ranks of the module, the cai and zhi. Uh, not only in the uh, number of jumps, um, <clears throat> but also in the comprehensive plan, right? That hierarchy. So um, the number of bays called the kai jian um, in Chinese term, um, and the uh, main facade is almost always of odd number because the odd number is in the uh, traditional Chinese philosophy is called the yang number um, or the active part and the even number were called the yin number so that yin and yang um, aspect of these numbers so for uh, the main facade the number of bays are almost always 9753. Uh, and that odd number also guaranteed um, the center of the main facade is a bay, not a column. Right? And the, um, the side could be even, could be odd. Sometimes it's even, sometimes it's odd. That is not um, specifically regulated. But the main facade, the long side of a building, is almost always odd number. <clears throat> and there are hierarchy, right? Number of bays, um, three bays, that is not as significant as a five bays um, or seven bay and uh, you know, nine, nine bay structure. So that hierarchy. 
um, as reflected in the brackets, in the plan, in the scale, and in the location of buildings within a complex was you know, part of the um, product of the Confucian uh, ritual system. Um, the ritual of Zhou that defined the capital for the son of heaven, capital city for the son of heaven. That is nine li square, nine mile square. And in the same book, it also talk about um, the capital city for um, a, a duke, um, a dukey kind of kingdom or a domain should be seven, seven li square. And then um, still lower five li square and then three li square, et cetera, and et cetera, right? So the Wang Cheng, as defined in the Book of Right, um, the ritual of Zhou is one of one books in the Books of Rights. Uh, <clears throat> kind of specified the hierarchy in the big scale uh, in the you know entire city. So that Confucian hi hierarchical order is reflected from the large scale city down to the small scale, um, tiny bracket. And the roof as well, we talked about that before. Now this lecture is like a summarization of that. Uh, one of the key elements in traditional Chinese architecture that is the ritual aspect as reflected in hierarchy. So the, the, um, the highest rank of the roof is the Wu Dian roof, the hip to roof, right? So that is a Wu Dian. And uh, the Xie Shan or hip and gable, right? So that is a Xie Shan, hip and gable. And a third one um, called a Cuan Jian, that is pointed. This is Cuan Jian or pointed uh, roof. So these three, can their roofs can be doubled. So <clears throat> double Eve is called a Chong Yan, right? So in that case, you have a Chong Yan Wu Dian, that one. That is double Eve, hip to roof. And that is the highest possible uh, roof style. And that would be called a Chong Yan Xie Shan or you know, double Eve, hip and gable roof. Uh, that is lower um, compared to, uh, to that one. And this would be called the, the uh, Chong Yan Cuan Jian or the double Eve pointed roof. And those are, um, you know, that is certainly more uh, significant than the single Eve one. <clears throat> so these, um, these are mostly used in official and imperial architecture, these three. And, uh, um, well, including that one, that is also, that is also a hip and gable roof, right? <clears throat> the difference is in the ridge, right? That, that one is actually, this one is actually a more standard uh, Xie Shan, so it has a ridge. And that one, the, the roof is curved. It's, uh, so <clears throat> um, that curved, it's called a juan peng, right? Basically, you don't have a ridge. You have two uh, purlins and you have a curved kind of a <clears throat> rafter to create a curve on the top of the roof instead of a, a sharp ridge like that. So both of them, both this one and that one <coughs> are called um, Xie Shan, all right, hip and gable. <coughs> so all these were only used in official or princely or imperial architecture. 
So common folks were only allowed to use um, the gabled, gabled roof like these two. And there are two types of gabled. Um, one is called the ying shan. So ying shan, which is this one. And uh, in the ying shan um, gabled roof, so you have the uh, side wall that stop the roof at the wall. And another type is called a xuan shan. Xuan shan is the overhanging gable. So in the xuan shan roof, um, the wall is under the roof. So the roof is overhanging, overhanging from the wall instead of being stopped by the wall. So these were um, for <clears throat> non-aristocratic families, but all the other ones can only be used by um, aristocracy, right? Imperial structure, princely structure, or imperially um, sponsored religious architecture. <clears throat> So that is part of the ritual system architecture uh, in a Confucian society, participate in the ritual system. And uh, just like in the Book of Rites, <clears throat> it talk about the ranks of the city. It also talk about the, the ranks of sacrificial activity. The Book of Rites talk about um, when the son of heaven makes sacrifice to their royal ancestor, they use, um, they use any many, as many as nine tripod. This is a tripod, right? A bronze tripod called a ding. Um, the ding tripod. <coughs> the ding tripod. And I talk about that the duke when he make sacrifice, he can use seven, and then the marquee five, etc., and etc. Uh, <clears throat> so it's a ritual system, hierarchic, hierarchical ritual system, like like in the city, you know, nine least square, seven least square, five least square, etc. And um, so in the ancestral sacrifice, it's nine tripod, seven tripod, five tripod, down to one tripod. Um, and then these were for um, the elite and um, commoners were not allowed to use bronze for their sacrifice, right? Commoners were only allowed to use um, ceramic pottery so that's the nature of this system of architecture, basically. Architecture is part of this ritual system. It's brackets, it's scale, it's complexity, and it's color. We're all defined by this ritual system. And this ritual system started in the Zhou Dynasty. And uh, <clears throat> as late as the Qing Dynasty, the last imperial dynasty, it was still active. So uh, the, the late imperial dynasties like the Ming Dynasty and Qing Dynasty publish the law. And in those laws, um, the law of Qing, the law of, you know, the code of um, the codes of the Qing Empire and the codes of the Ming Empire, they um, provide great detail in terms of how um, you know, different rank of the society were uh, able to build for themselves. Um, you know, what kind of color you are allowed to use, what kind of color you are not allowed to use, etc., and etc. So traditional Chinese architecture <clears throat> is a product of not pure kind of aesthetic uh, consideration. It's not just about form. It's not just about beauty. It is, um, it is participating in the ritual system. 
So what I'm saying is not that um, formal consideration and the beauty is, is not important. It is important. What I'm saying is the opposite. Um, what I wanted to say is that, in fact, in our contemporary world, what we call beauty, what we call formal consideration, still had a large amount of ritual consideration. Right? The ritual system, you know, if you observe carefully enough and critically enough, you would recognize a lot of phenomena in architecture and in every aspect of modern and contemporary life that is still pretty uh, ritualistic. You know, re ritual, if we understand the word ritual in a more, in a broader, um, broader way. Um, so that ritual element, um, <clears throat> it's still pretty active in any human activity uh, of any period. So it's just in the Confucian society that is most dramatically and demonstrated and most clearly um, expressed. So <clears throat> um, this, this ritual system and this, you know, Dogong somehow, you know, became a symbol of that architectural tradition. But it is simultaneously doing it on all level. It created, <clears throat> it, uh, it is a unit that is simultaneously um, everything, simultaneously structural, functional, decorative, and ritual. Um, so Dogong, it is um, a very uh, symbolic joint. Um, it is a, a unit of signification. It's significant, but it also signifies. Um, it communicates meaning. It is not only structural, it is also uh, a, a unit of signification. It is telling a story and it is suggesting rank, it is communicating a lot of information beyond its, its architectural, structural, and uh, you know, even artistic. Uh, uh, <clears throat> so while the, the bracket um, provide the module for a building, According to um, the study of Professor Fu Xinian, um, <clears throat> that the entire, uh, entire Chinese complex might be based on that module. For example, Professor Fu um, recognized or you know, discovered the forbidden city from the you know, Ming and Qing Dynasty. We are going to look at the Forbidden City in more detail later. But here, I just want to point out, according to Professor Fu's study, the entire Forbidden, forbidden City was based on a module. For example, if you look at the largest courtyard within the giant courtyard of the Forbidden City, this one, It doubled that courtyard. It's a four times in area than that courtyard. So um, each dimension doubles the smaller one. So if this is one, then this is two, and this is two, and this is four, right? Just like the uh, the way those the cai works in the um, in the song in the Fa Shi, right? So it's the same proportion. And, um, and this one, this unit doubles that. 
And um, you might further recognize if you use this shape to analyze those sm yet smaller courtyards, you recognize it, it is the same shape as that one, that part. So he recognized that. Uh, and uh, so this is like three times of those smaller courtyards. In another word, this is kind of a um, further divided into, into smaller courtyards. So <clears throat> the large scale planning also has a module. And of course, down to the smaller unit in the planning scale and that small courtyard and each individual building was based on the module of the bracket. So in another word, the small module from a bracket generate the whole um, large scale building um, of, of grand structure like the Forbidden City. So, and um, we might even, you know, further study also discover that the whole city of Beijing was based on the Forbidden City as a unit, right? So if we take this as a unit and then the whole city of Beijing, Ming and Qing Dynasty Beijing was also based on that in its planning. So that hierarchy <clears throat> um, and a module, the hierarchy using axis and uh, using position, color, and scale to communicate, to communicate rank and hierarchy. And then the module was used to create harmony, to harmonize the built environment from the tiniest bracket to the largest general city. So Beijing, um, as a result, was um, a city of you know, great order. It has a great sense of order and harmony. And that harmony is hierarchical. So that this is the entire city of Beijing. So according to some scholar, and you know, when we put to that scale, it is really depend on whether you believe it or not. So some scholar also argue that the whole city of Beijing was based on, was using the forbidden city as a module to construct the whole, whole city. <clears throat> um, so bracket or dogong, can also serve as a historical reference. Um, the general tendency is from the early period. So this is the Tang Dynasty, like the eighth century. And the, this is the Qing Dynasty, the Qing Dynasty, the, say the 18th century, right? So the general tendency from the eighth century to the 18th century during this 1000 year, is that the bracket became smaller and smaller proportionally um, in terms of proportion. For example, the Tang Dynasty, the height of the bracket very often is almost half the height. So the height of the bracket is almost the same as the column below. But in the Qing Dynasty, the height of the bracket is, is way smaller than the height of the column. So that's one general tendency. Another tendency, general tendency is um, its structural function became, became less and less significant and its decorative function um, progressively uh, increase from the early period to the later period. So the, the other ones are in between. So say this is Tang Dynasty, these are, these are the Song Dynasty. 
and uh, you know the the Liao and the Jin, the Ming, the Yuan Dynasty, Ming Dynasty. So Qing Dynasty, um, the bracket almost was reduced to a decorative element. So these are discovered by Professor Liang Sicheng. Um, Professor Liang had made this observation. And today we can almost use this as a historical reference. Say you encounter a unknown structure and you want to guess the age. So if you see a huge bracket in, in proportion to the other structure, you <clears throat> might say, you know, it's an early uh, building. And if it's bracket are significantly smaller and mostly decorative. So chances are it is a, um, uh, a late um, building, late imperial building. So Dogon can be used as a historical reference in the study of traditional Chinese architecture. Um, so a comparison of a, this is a 10th century building and this is a 18th century, right? So um, you might notice here, the bracket is very visible, but here you barely see the bracket. Bracket is just a tiny little band there. Um, and uh, another tendency is the slope of the roof. I think I also mentioned before, the roof became higher and higher. So this is also quite obvious in the early building, you barely see the roof from the ground, but in later building, you can see the roof um, from the ground. That is because the angle of the roof in the later period is, is sharper. And the earlier one is usually <clears throat> more um, leveled. So I think that's the um, major part of this lecture. And uh, I just want to show you the rest of the slide to kind of compare the, the Eastern or East Asian architecture, you know, China, Japan, and Korea included that features post and lintel system. Um, to me, the best symbol for the post and lintel um, East Asian architecture is the Japanese poly, the Japanese um, memorial arch, which is you know just a post and a lintel. And a bracket can be considered a, a um, more ornate version of this simple post and lintel system. And in the West, <clears throat> it is the trifle arch that summarizes the arch decorated with the um, the Greek order, right? So the Greek order plus the Roman arch, and also the memorial gate is a symbol of the the um, simplest possible architectural expression of that system. You know, simplest possible expression of post and lintel, simplest possible expression of the arch and vault. And uh, they created different um, appearance. On the left is the Meiji Shrine in Japan. On the right, is the uh, Notre Dame um, Cathedral <clears throat> in Paris. And uh, the interior, right? The contrast, post and lintel, and here arch and a vault. <clears throat> and um, looked from below, the um, were capable of making their own expression in the creation of architectural characters. And um, they also experience change, historical change. Classical order in the medieval time 
was substituted by this kind of medieval capitals that had um, that is very diversified, and so are the um, East Asian brackets. You know, sometimes it can be carved into this figurative decoration, showing a flying figure. Substituting those arms in the in the dogon, kind of more decorative, uh, deviate from the standard standard um, dogon, just like medieval capital deviate from the classical kind of uh, Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian. Um, and uh, they are very different. However, they were capable of doing capable of participating in every aspect of the uh, human society. Uh, the East Asian building and the uh, European ones. And they can also be developed into really compli complicated um, surfaces that, um, that were both kind of structural, uh, functional, and at the same time, decorative, right? Um, just like in the, the Gothic, um, late Gothic building that developed the rivet vault uh, into really an unnecessary complexity, creating a very decorative ceiling that evolved from the structural uh, necessity. The Chinese architecture and or East Asian architecture also had that capability and that structural element were explored to create um, a dazzling complexity that is way beyond structural necessity. Um, and I think, you know, modern architecture is doing the same thing. Modern architecture, no matter how much it claim being structurally uh, integrate, um, how much it claim that is, it is um, aiming for efficiency, aiming for um, kind of a functionality, uh, there is a decorative aspect in every building. There is a ritual aspect in every building, no matter whether it is old or is new. So something like this, um, the way these members were combined was way beyond uh, structural necessity. There is always a formal and a ritual consideration behind it. And those formal and, you know, ritual um, aspect is always somehow connected to functionality and a structural integrity. So, um, so basically what I want to, I, I try to express is, you know, we tend to separate these things, but when we look at our history, um, these things that we tend to divide had always been a integrated whole, um, whole thing. And when we look at that history and when we come back to look at our own architectural practice, we recognize indeed uh, when we try to separate structure from form, beauty from, you know, um, functionality, um, we actually can never, you know, totally separate those things. Um, the, and it is more, much more productive to consider them as comprehensive thing and uh, to, um, to make connections and acknowledge that these aspects of architecture are integrated and uh, 
and to acknowledge the, um, the wholeness of architectural practice. Um, and that element is kind of not only in grand structure, but also in um, humble structure. So in big building, there is a, we can observe the integration of form and function, structure and beauty. And even in the humblest building, we, we can recognize that um, the form and function, the beauty and uh, structural element cannot be um, separated absolutely. They are always kind of integrated, right? All right, we can um, stop here for this lecture. <laughs>